look around us and we see a lot of people who have mastered a particular profession or a particular skill, and they're very good at that. But the rest of their lives are a mess. They can be real bastards, really horrible people in their dealings with others, or in the uses to which they put that skill. The Dharma is different. To really learn the Dharma, you have to become a good person. It doesn't mean that you have to start out good, but it does mean that you have to develop a full range of virtues all around. If you're really going to understand what the Buddha is talking about, and understanding here means not just understanding the words, but getting to the meaning. The word meaning in Pali, atta, A-T-T-H-A. It's different from atta, which is self, but A-T-T-H-A, atta, also means goal. So we talk about the meaning of the Dharma. It's meant to take you to a goal. So it's not just meaning in terms of translating it into other words, but translating into changes in your mind and bringing about an experience, an understanding. And to have that experience and understanding requires lots of virtues. We have the techniques of the meditation. You can learn how to focus on the breath. But as the Buddha said, you can be a person of little integrity and you can still do the meditation in the sense of getting the mind to be quiet for a while. But then you start misusing that, and that gets in the way of getting to the deeper attainments, the really the good part of the Dharma, what the Buddha called the essence of the Dharma. And it starts with, as he said, being honest and being observant. He once said, let someone who is honest and observant come. Someone who is no dissembler, and I'll teach that person the Dharma. Honest, in the sense you have to be willing to observe what's really going on in your mind and admit to yourself what's going on in the mind. Honesty is not just the way you treat other people, but it's also the way you treat your internal conversation. Of course, observing, you have to see what's going on first, and then you admit to, to yourself, and then you can learn. So it's with honesty and an ability to really see things. Then notice what's going on and not just pass it away and let things pass in apathy. Another spot where he's teaching karma, he starts with the virtues of generosity and gratitude. For most of us, when we hear about karma, there's that oh darn moment when you start thinking about all the bad things you did in the past and think about the th bad things that are going to happen to you in the future because of that. But the Buddha doesn't talk about that at all. He does say that certain actions tend to lead to certain results. But the fact that a past bad action has happened doesn't mean that the future can't make some changes in how it's going to be experienced. There's an analogy the Buddha gives of the this is a crystal of salt. You've got a crystal of salt, say the fist, size of your fist. You put it into a cup of water, you can't drink the water because the water is just way too salty. But if you put it into a large river of clean water, you can still drink the water in the river. In the same way, if you develop an expansive mind, the things that happened from the past, even though they may be large crystals of salt, don't necessarily make you have to suffer. So when the Buddha is teaching karma, it's not solely for the purpose of making you feel bad about what you've done in the past. He always emphasizes the fact you have to realize you've made mistakes in the past, but you can resolve not to do them again. And then you develop a, an expansive mind, a mind of goodwill, a mind of compassion and empathy, a mind of equanimity. Learn how to train yourself so, not to, so as not to be overcome by pleasure or overcome by pain. And you develop your virtue and your discernment. These qualities expand your mind. So what comes in from the past doesn't have to make you suffer. What the Buddha does emphasize when he introduces the topic of karma is, on the one hand, the need to be responsible and to look at the present moment, not worry about the past. You focus on your present moment. What are you doing right now? 
and was teaching karma to his son. Basically what he's teaching is teaching his son how to be honest and how to be observant. So he'd be a good person to learn the Dharma to begin with. First he reminds him of the virtue of being truthful. And then he says, look at your actions. What are you doing? When you do something, what do you expect is going to come from that action? Expect anything harmful? Don't do it. If you don't foresee any harm, you can go ahead and do it. While you're acting, if any harm comes up, because after all, some of your actions have immediate results, you don't have to wait until the next lifetime. It's like spitting into the wind. You don't have to wait for the next lifetime for it to come back at you. So if any harmful results are coming up, you stop what you're doing. Don't feel that you're committed to the action. But you don't see any harm, you can continue with what you're doing. Then when you're done, you look at the long-term results. And here's where the honesty has to come in and the observance. Being observant, seeing what you did, and being truthful about it. You're going, if you made a mistake, okay, you could talk it over with someone else. Someone who's more advanced on the path so you can get some good ideas as to how not to repeat the mistake. And if you saw there are no bad results, then take pleasure in the fact, take joy in the fact that you're making progress in the path and can try to continue with the progress. The Buddhist teachings a lot of good qualities of the character here. Teaching compassion. You don't want to harm anybody. He's teaching integrity, teaching the ability to take responsibility for your actions, and a desire and a willingness to learn. And he's showing you how to do it. So this is how you become honest, and this is how you become even more observant. And this is how you make good use of the teaching on karma. Instead of getting upset about things you've done in the past, you say, look, I can focus on the present moment, and that will make all the difference. And then you can learn from what you do in the present moment. Another place where the Buddha introduces karma, the main emphasis is on generosity and gratitude, focusing on the fact that people do have choices. And it's because we have choices the choices that we will be responsible for. That's why generosity means something. A lot of people don't like the idea of responsibility. They'd rather have karma-free zones in large areas of their lives where they can just do what they want and not have to deal with the results or have someone else protect them from the results. But that's a childish attitude. If we wanted to live in a world where your actions had no results, that would mean that generosity would have no meaning. Gratitude would have no meaning. Actions would just be kind of thrown around without any consequences, but they wouldn't have any meaning at all. It's because we are responsible for actions that they do have meaning. So when other people help us, we have to think about the extent to which, to which they went out of their way. That may not have always been easy. And you want to have gratitude for that. Gratitude here is something that's stronger than appreciation. We can appreciate the sun, we can appreciate the sky and the trees. Appreciate just the way things are. But gratitude is something different. Gratitude is for actions that people have done. The word in Pali, actually, katainyu, literally means having a sense, having an awareness of what was done. And that deserves a special quality of the heart, more than just appreciating how nice things can be, but realizing that somebody had to do something for some of these things to be nice, some of your conditions in life to be good. And if you don't have any gratitude for that, it's very unlikely that you're going to go out of your way to help others. And this connects directly with what the Buddha said about generosity, the fact that we have choices and our choices have Results means that when you think of being generous to someone else, okay, that's a good thing. That's to be encouraged. It really does have meaning. There's a spot where the Buddha says, if you're stingy, there's no way you're going to attain John, and there's no way at all you're going to attain any of the noble attainments. And it's good to think about why. 
when you're generous, you take something over which you have right. No one can force you to give it away, but you decide you want to give it away. The internal dialogue that goes with that, with that is good for the mind. The dialogue where you can overcome your greed, you overcome your aversion, overcome all the unskillful things that would get in the way of being generous, and freely give something away. You've lifted yourself above your defilements, and it was a free choice. This is why there's lots of rules for the monks and how they treat the generosity of lay people, because the monks aren't the beneficiaries of generosity. So we have to be very careful that we don't abuse that position. And one of the things that the Buddha says is someone asks you, where should I give? You say, give where you feel inspired, or you feel that it would be well used or well taken care of. That's it. You don't go out fundraising. You don't go around making hints that you would like this or like that. You wait for people to make the offer. If they make the offer, say, let me know what you need. Okay, that's a special case. But even then, you don't want to abuse that. And John Fung said that he was always very careful. The only things he would ask for would be Dharma books and medicine. That was it. In other words, things that were really necessary. But the reason there are all these rules around generosity is because the Buddha wants to preserve the freeness of the gift, the free choice involved in the gift. Because it's in that internal dialogue on how to give up a particular object, how to give up a little bit of money that it costs to buy something, or to give up the time that you could use for something you want to do that you give to someone else to help them. Or you give of your energy, or you give of your forgiveness in places where it's hard. Okay, that internal dialogue where you can talk yourself into doing the right thing is a good exercise for the mind. Because after all, as you get the mind into meditation, you're going to have to be giving up a lot of other things that, again, are your right. You have the perfect right to sit here and think lustful thoughts for an hour or angry thoughts for an hour. But then what would you gain? The mind would get even more lustful, give it even more likely to be angry, shorten your fuse. Whereas if you learn to give them up of your own free will and learn how to talk yourself into letting, putting them down and letting them stay down, you've learned an important skill. This is one of the reasons why generosity is so essential. Throughout the practice, and Bodun used to like to say that that the whole practice is one thing all the way clear through from the very beginning to the very end. It's all about letting go. Well, to let go requires an internal dialogue where the good side of your nature takes charge over the greedier or more narrow side of your nature. So you can develop that goodness that's required for the Dharma. So that you can actually understand and see the drama, experience the drama. So look at all the opportunities to be generous as opportunities to see and understand the drama, to practice that internal dialogue that's needed in areas where you discover that you're more and more attached. I mean, certain things you can give away and it's no big deal. But certain of your defilements, certain types of greed or aversion, things you really like or you're really attached to, you tend to identify yourself around them. This is the way I am, and it's going to take a long time for me to change that kind of attitude. If you haven't learned how to be generous, it's going to be hard to give up these things that are even stickier, where the attachment goes even deeper. So it's good to make a practice of generosity so you can begin chipping away and learning the skills you need to give up the things that, over which you have a perfect right to keep, but are really not in your own best interest to keep, keep with you. You'd be much better off letting them go.